You're listening to Reimagined Radio. Real talk, real life, real magic. Welcome to Success Unlimited with Dr. Patricia Thompson. If you want to be more successful while also being happier at work and at home, you're in the right place. We'll be covering research along with little tweaks, tips, and hacks that will help you to fulfill your potential in the business world without sacrificing your peace of mind. Have you ever envisioned yourself being an exceptional leader? You know, the kind of leader who can rally a team and inspire others to achieve their potential and do great things. Now, whether you're already in a leadership position, but maybe know you could stand to improve your skills, or if you're not a leader yet, but you know you want to become one, then this episode is for you. Because in this show, I'm going to be covering the seven essential qualities to becoming a consummate leader. And the material is actually based on my book of the same name. And then once we cover the characteristics that you're going to want to cultivate in yourself, I'm going to give you some practical strategies that you can start applying today so that you can become a more effective leader. And like I said, if you're not a leader yet, then they'll get you well on your way to becoming one. So let's get started. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with my background, I am a corporate psychologist and an executive coach. And what that means is that for the bulk of my career, I've been working with people in a variety of positions and organizations. So I work with senior leaders like the C-suite and vice presidents. Um, I work with relatively new leaders like directors and managers. And I work with aspiring leaders, people who haven't yet gotten a leadership position, but they're hoping very much to get there. And regardless of what level they're at, I really do love helping them to be more effective and to reach their career goals. Now, from the outside looking in, it can seem like once people have reached high levels of leadership that, you know, they feel like they're totally on top of things and like they've completely mastered their roles, you know, like they could do them in their sleep. However, one of the things that I found is that despite the confident exterior that a lot of my clients are able to convey, many of them still worry about whether or not they're leading their employees in the best way possible. Yeah, you know, they wanted their responsibility, but at the same time, it can feel like a lot of pressure. And they might wonder things like, you know, how can I really motivate people? Or do I really belong here? Or can we really accomplish the goals that I've set? Or, you know, am I really helping them to make the most of their careers? And so I found that even the most accomplished people have insecurities. And so my hope is that if you're struggling with any of these questions or wondering how to become a better leader, that first of all, just realize those are very normal concerns. But then I also hope that in today's episode, you'll learn something that you can take back to work and it'll give you a little bit more confidence that you're well on your way to becoming the leader that you want to be. Okay, so let's talk about this idea of consummate leadership. What exactly is a consummate leader? Well, based on my experience working with, you know, probably thousands of leaders, honestly, by this point, um, I found that the exceptional ones are people who are able to lead effectively in a way that motivates and engages people, but also, you know, get stuff done because essentially that's what they're there for. Um, And, you know, as you might have imagined, there are a lot of different ways that you could accomplish that goal. And so as I'm talking this through, I'm going to be talking about more general characteristics. I'm not going to be talking about the specifics of managing people, but really the underlying characteristics that I've seen in consummate leaders. And if you think about it, you might even have worked for a consummate leader in your lifetime. And maybe take a moment to reflect on your best boss and think about what sort of characteristics he or she had. So I've worked with a lot of great leaders across the years, and one that comes to mind just recently is uh, someone who I'll call Sarah, and I'm going to use her as an example, but I'm going to change a bit of the identifying information just so that she can, you know, stay anonymous. So Sarah was a vice president who I worked with, and she'd been brought into her organization to turn around some departments that were in some serious need of attention. And when I first started working with her, the first thing I noticed was how warm and outgoing she was. So she was someone who was quick to laugh and she genuinely enjoyed connecting with people. And so for the first few weeks that she was at the organization, she spent most of her time just getting to know people. So going out to lunch and finding out about them and their families. 
Um, Sarah was also someone who willingly took on challenges. Um, I remember one time when they were considering changing a vendor that the organization used, and that might not sound like such a big deal, um, but they'd worked with the same vendor for 50 years. And so people had become very attached to their products. However, Sarah felt that she could find a better product at a cheaper cost and with better customer service. And so she decided that she was going to take that on, even though it might not be universally well received. She really had a deep sense of purpose that she was doing the right thing for everyone. And she was really optimistic that people would adjust. And they did. And the company benefited as a result. Now, the thing is that even though Sarah was really upbeat, she was not a pushover. She was courageous and very authentic when she expressed her opinions. And she placed a lot of focus on her team because she wanted to make sure that everyone was meeting their potential. So she was always coaching them. And she even hired me to come in and do personality assessments so that she could understand them better and use that information to really help them to grow and so that she can motivate them. And, you know, Sarah was someone who was also very open about her own needs for development. And so she would tell people about her areas that she could grow and she really welcomed their feedback. So she didn't have a defensive bone in her body and that helped her to ensure that she was consistently growing. And then finally, even though Sarah's job was really demanding with early morning meetings with her boss and sometimes evening meetings with the board, she made sure to make time for her family and friends and she always worked out. And so as you might imagine from this description, Sarah was really successful um, and she was actually promoted to an even more senior leadership position within about six months of the time that she joined the organization. And the reason why is that she had a lot of characteristics of a consummate leader. So let's go through the characteristics. And as I go through them, you might want to reflect on how you think you're doing with each one. So the first characteristic of a consummate leader is self-awareness. And in my opinion, this is a foundation of strong leadership. Um, I actually once worked for a boss that was totally lacking in this area. Okay, now maybe not totally, but um, definitely had some deficits in this area. So for example, you know, he would think he was being really inspirational when in reality he was demotivating people. And he even did it with clients. You know, he thought he was being smooth and they thought he was being sleazy. And so as a result, a lot of talented people quit working for him across the years because they just didn't like his style. Now, on the other hand, a self-aware leader really knows her strengths. She knows her opportunities for growth, her triggers, you know, her values, what drives her and everything in between. And because she knows what makes her tick, she's able to gauge how she's coming across to others and the impact she's having on them. And she also knows the areas that she's not as strong in, and she gets help when she needs it, or else maybe she hires people who can balance her out in those areas. So I think, you know, the bottom line is, as a leader, you in a sense are kind of like the conductor of an orchestra. And so you're using yourself as the instrument to help others to perform at their best. And so being self-aware allows you to really use your strengths effectively, and then manage your potential liabilities so that you can, you know, best help others to succeed. Now, the second characteristic of a consummate leader is spirituality. And I don't necessarily define spirituality in the religious sense. Instead, I think of it as having a deep sense of purpose. You know, the idea that you're part of something bigger than yourself. And having a sense of meaning in your work really allows you to dig deep when the going gets tough. And I think being able to set a vision for others and create a sense of meaning for them helps them to be more engaged and also inspired by their work on a day-to-day basis. So a few years ago, I saw the movie Selma. And if you haven't seen it, you really should definitely check it out because it's excellent. And um, it was about the 1965 Selma to Montgomery March and how Martin Luther King Jr. led ordinary people like you and me to secure voting rights for blacks. Now, as I watched that movie, one of the many things that struck me was how people were willing to go through all sorts of hardship, like even putting their lives in danger and being beaten because of their deep sense of purpose in a cause that was bigger than themselves. And thanks to Dr. King's leadership, the country was transformed. Now think about it. I mean, if his leadership skills enabled him to motivate a team of people to even put themselves in harm's way in the pursuit of an important goal, don't you think he might be able to get some good results in your environment by giving people a compelling sense of purpose? 
Um, so hopefully, you know, that's a little bit of inspiration to you. And I'm, I'm sure the goals that you're trying to achieve are nothing as big as that. I mean, maybe they are, but, you know, odds are they aren't. Um, but if he was able to really achieve that, think of what you might be able to achieve in your own organization. Okay, so the third characteristic of consummate leadership is self-management. And by this, I mean an effective leader manages his thoughts, his health, his energy, and his focus. And so, you know, basically it's taking care of yourself on a physical level so that you're up to the demands of your position. Now, I've seen far too many people devote themselves to work on a 24-7 basis, and they think that that's the path to get ahead, but then they soon discover, or maybe that they don't, um, that it's really the path to burnout. Or they might make themselves less efficient because they don't have enough brain power to be at their best. And so while hard work can definitely be an important pathway to success, research shows that a lack of balance actually works against you. And if you doubt it, um, go look up my other episode on what science says about taking breaks. So self-management helps you to ensure that you have the energy you need during the time that you devote to work. And you do this through self-care, you know, making sure that you have enough fuel in the tank to be at your best. You know, think about it. I mean, most of us are at our worst when we're under stress or when we're not taking care of ourselves. You know, we might shut down or lash out or make rash decisions or just be too tired to get anything done. Um, but if you take care of yourself, then, you know, you're a lot less likely to have those sorts of outcomes. And so people who are consummate leaders really understand that. And so they view self-care as a necessity as opposed to a luxury. Okay, the fourth characteristic of consummate leadership is positivity. And there is a wealth of research that shows that more positive leaders tend to get better results. And so strong leaders really know how to manage their emotions and be in a place in which they're genuinely in a positive mood, you know, for the bulk of the time. Now, I'm not talking about being a Pollyanna who's completely out of touch with reality. And I'm also not talking about turning yourself into a robot who never has a negative thought or who never gets upset about anything. But what I'm saying is that effective leaders know how to manage their moods effectively so that if they're upset, they're able to bounce back from it relatively quickly. You know, research shows that if you can maintain a relatively optimistic and upbeat temperament and outlook, you'll do a better job of motivating the people around you. It, I mean, it's just that simple. And you'll also do a better job of creating an environment in which they can do their best work. Uh, characteristic number five is authenticity. So consummate leaders are genuine and real. They let others know the real them and they express their opinions even when they might not be popular. And because they're clear but respectful in expressing their point of view, they earn their seat at the table. You know, remember as a leader that part of your role is to influence what's going on in the organization. And how are you going to do that if you're afraid to speak up or if you keep all of your opinions to yourself? You're just not going to be able to. Now, another benefit of being authentic is that you're able to create an environment in which people can get to know you. Um, research shows that when you disclose information about yourself to others, you know, not oversharing, but in an appropriate way, um, it causes other people to trust you more because they see that you are, in a sense, you know, putting your trust in them. And a while back, I actually wrote an article on a site called Tiny Buddha about authenticity. Um, and you can find it on my website or reach out to me if you want me to send you a link to it. Um, and in the article, I shared my own journey about developing the courage to be more authentic and the many rewards that came along with it. And that article really resonated with a lot of people. And to this day, it's one of the ones that I've gotten the most feedback about. And, you know, while it was great to know that I was able to inspire a lot of people with that post, what the reaction told me was that it can often feel like a pretty big risk to just be yourself. Um, but what my own experience has taught me, and, you know, what I've also seen with clients, is that authenticity usually gains you respect. And it's also just very freeing and empowering. Um, but it also helps others to better connect with you. So it really is something worth fostering it. And, you know, actually, now that I'm saying this, this might be a good topic for a future episode. So um, stay tuned. Okay, um, the sixth characteristic of consummate leadership is relationship building. Effective leaders know that by building genuine relationships, they can create a sense of camaraderie on their teams. And those relationships help them to connect with others and also influence them and they just generally help them to get things done. Um, and you know, when I ask people about their favorite bosses, 
A lot of them tell me that their favorite boss was someone who really took an interest in them as a person and really seemed to care about them as an employee. And that's the power of relationships. And, you know, what I found is that, you know, even though a lot of people who are good with relationships are extroverts, a lot of introverts are very good with relationships as well. So, you know, the key is really caring about people and recognizing that work isn't just, you know, work in the sense that it's a bunch of robots coming in and getting things done. You know, what really brings a sense of richness to the workplace is enjoying the people you work with and, you know, appreciating them around you. So if you do that, you'll be well on your way to becoming a fantastic leader. Okay, so now we're down to the last characteristic of consummate leadership, and it's coaching and developing. So strong leaders know that they can't do everything by themselves, and they're only as good as the teams around them. And so they really do put an emphasis on developing their people to help them to grow their skills. And this approach not only gets work done in the present, but then it also prepares their people and their areas to get even more work done in the future. And so just like the coach of an athlete sees the potential in that person and gives them consistent feedback and suggestions so that they can develop, but also gives them a lot of positive feedback, you should be doing the same as a leader. I mean, you know, think about it. If you think of any leaders in your past who seem sincerely interested in your career, you know, you were probably pretty loyal to them and they probably helped you grow. And so coaching not only helps the person, but it also helps you in terms of your ability to be able to influence them and, you know, help them to help you to accomplish your goals. And what I would say is that if you're not a leader yet, then you can focus on the ways that you can be helpful to others in the organization. You know, maybe you have a skill you could teach or some tips to share, and then just take the time to do it. It'll be good practice for when you eventually do get a leadership role. Okay, so now that we know the characteristics of a consummate leader, how in the world do you become one? Well, obviously I can't go through everything you need to do in this episode, and I'm actually getting a little longer than I wanted to already. Um, But what I did want to do was give you four strategies that you can start using immediately that'll help you to become a more effective leader or get you on the path to becoming one. Start with some self-awareness strategies. Um, You know, because like I said, I really do believe that that's the foundation of strong leadership. And, you know, like I said, you're basically using yourself as an instrument to motivate, guide, and inspire people. And if you don't know how the instrument works best, then you're going to have a harder time using it. Um, You know, another aspect of self-awareness is that's so important is that it's a central part of emotional intelligence, which is basically knowing how to manage your emotions effectively and kind of recognize how you're coming across. So self-awareness is important for that. Um, And it can also help you to guard against blind spots, you know, being in a situation where, you know, you're metaphorically walking around with spinach in your teeth where everyone else knows something about you that you're unaware of. If you're self-aware, then you're able to guard against that. So here are a couple things that we are going to have you start doing today so that you can become self-aware. And the first way is pretty straightforward. You're simply going to make an exhaustive list of your strengths and developmental opportunities. And so to do this, all you do is take out a sheet of paper or open a file on Word and write down at least 10 strengths you possess. And it could be things like being really organized or connecting with people. Maybe you're good at um, picking up new information quickly or you're an excellent listener. Whatever they are, just make the list. And the reason why it's important to consider these is because a lot of times we take our strengths for granted and then we're not always intentional about using them to our best advantage. So, you know, if you can consciously use them, they can help you to be at your best. Okay, so after you've made your list of strengths, then you're going to write down at least five areas for development. And it could be things like maybe you could benefit from more confidence, or you could be more assertive, or maybe you don't focus on relationships enough, or maybe you could work on work-life balance. You know, whatever they are, just write them down. And knowing your developmental areas is helpful because you can better monitor them. And then it also lets you know, you know, kind of where you can start in terms of working on them. You can, you know, put an action plan in place so that you could grow there. And I want to stress that, excuse me, when you're working on your developmental areas and listing them, be constructive about it. Okay, so we all have areas for development. You know, that's part of what makes life fun, that we consistently have opportunities to grow. So don't beat yourself up about them. Just see them as potential things that you could work on. 
Okay, so that's task number one, strengths and developmental opportunities. Okay, so let's go on to task number two for improving your um, emotional, not your emotional intelligence, your self-awareness. So task number two is that you're going to seek feedback. So I quickly mentioned blind spots earlier. And the reason why people often have blind spots is because no one is willing to tell them. And so obviously the way you find out about them is by getting other people to tell you by seeking feedback. Now, I've coached a lot of people across the years, and I would have to say that most of them were not too fond of feedback. You know, we love the positive stuff, but the stuff that tells us about the ways that we can improve is not always so fun. Um, And because a lot of us have that feeling, it can create a dynamic where others don't want to give us feedback. But if you don't have feedback about your blind spots, then you can't do anything to address them or to grow. So the key for getting helpful feedback is just to make sure you're asking for it in such a way that makes it easier for others to give it to you. Now, like I said, I want to be mindful of the length of this episode, so I'm not going to go into this in great depth. Um, But what I would say is that you'll want to make sure that when you're asking for feedback, you have the right tone, you listen without defensiveness, and then you make sure to, you know, say thank you. Um, And you don't argue in the moment or you'll likely never get feedback again. And of course, you know, do not offer your own feedback to the person unless they ask you to do so, because then again, you're never going to get feedback in the future. Okay, so um, those were two tips to improve your self-awareness. And now I want to move on to a tip that can help you to improve in the spirituality realm. Now, like I said, as I'm talking about spirituality, it's nothing religious. What it is, is having a sense of meaning and purpose in your work. And in my work with clients, I've really found that a lack of meaning is something that can cause a lot of anxiety and emptiness for people. You know, I've seen some leaders try to motivate people by making it all about money or about goals, but that simply doesn't resonate for everyone. And so as a result, they can find that their people are unmotivated to their best work, and they might think that their people are just unmotivated in general, when really what it is is that they don't have a sense of meaning in their work. You know, research shows that when we have a sense of purpose, it really inspires us to be more resilient and to fight through challenges. And so when you're engaging in your own work, you know, a sense of meaning gives you a reason bigger for yourself than doing it and more motivation to persist. And it's the same with employees. You know, a really quick example, um, I worked with a hospital and uh, they uh, were faced with a hurricane. And whenever anyone would talk about that time that they dealt with the hurricane, they mentioned how stressful it was, but at the same time, how energizing it was because they had a clear mission and purpose. You know, they were helping people who were really in need of help, even sometimes their colleagues and neighbors, and everyone came um, together as a real team. And so that's the power of purpose. It really does inspire people to do amazing things. So um, how do you create more of a sense of uh, meaning in your own job? What if, you know, as you think about your job, it doesn't feel like a calling. It just feels like drudgery. Do you need to be writing a a resignation letter? Um, Well, not necessarily. Um, Sometimes it just takes a shift in perspective. And so another exercise you can do is to rewrite your job description into what's called a calling description. So think about how you can write the aspects of your job in a way that really highlights the meaning of it. So let me give you a quick example. Um, So I'm an executive coach and I looked up a job description for it. And, you know, some of what I found are things like, you know, provide individual and team coaching as well as develop client relationships, provide coaching for training, mentoring, team effectiveness, management, transitions, etc. That sounds pretty standard, but not really something that gets you excited. Um, And, you know, in my own mind, I really do consider my purpose to be helping and inspiring other people to live happier and more productive lives. And so when I wrote a calling description, things that I included were like build collaborative relationships with clients and partner with them to help them to achieve their dreams, inspire, excite, motivate, and spark my clients to achieve more than they ever thought possible train groups to understand that they can work together to achieve bold goals in an environment that's fun and rewarding. And so to me, it's the same work that I'm doing, but if I look at it in a way that taps into the sense of meaning, it can give me a greater sense of purpose and remind me about, you know, what's so positive about my job, maybe on the days when it doesn't feel so great. Um, And that's something I can get passionate about. And so after you've done it for yourself, 
Um, if you are currently a leader, you might want to in, um, encourage your employees to think about how their work fits into their values, and that might allow them to tap into a greater sense of purpose and meaning in their work. Okay, so that's strategy number three. And you'll notice that as I talked about them, they're mostly focusing on yourself. But remember that you really do have to be in touch with yourself to be able to lead effectively. You know, if you're like, for example, going around offending people and you're not aware of it, then I don't care what leadership tips I give you, you know, you're not going to be as effective as you could be. So that's why we're focusing on you. But now I'm going to finish with the strategy that you can use in working with other people. And this is related to the seventh characteristic, which was coaching and developing your people. Um, and there's actually research that they've done where they looked at the best ways to coach people. And in this study, they actually coached people in two ways. Um, the first way was just to ask the person about their goals, their dreams and desires. And this was considered the more positive way of coaching. Um, and then the second way was just to check in on how they were doing. Like, you know, where are you on this task? How are you handling this subjective, et cetera? And honestly, the second way is the way that I usually see leaders coaching their people on an ongoing basis. Um, and the researchers did F fMRIs and they actually trained brain activity and it showed big differences in how people's brains responded to the different types of coaching. Um, with the more positive coaching, the parts of the brain that were associated with visualizing and imagining were activated. And they also showed that those people had a more relaxed nervous system that was, you know, in a sense, more open to what was coming and their reward centers were lit up. The second type of coaching where you just checked in on what they were doing um, showed that parts of the brain that were associated with self-consciousness and guilt were activated. So the person was essentially in a more defensive state. Now, I think this is really fascinating stuff because it shows that how we approach something can either create someone who is open to coaching or someone who is literally physically less likely to take it in. So if you want to focus on coaching compassionately, what you're going to want to do is make sure that you're paying attention to the relationship and get the person in a place where they can be open. And you can do this by focusing on their career, their goals, dreams, you know, and how their work today helps them to move towards their longer term objectives. And then after you've done that, when the person's receptive, then you get into the nuts and bolts of, you know, how things are going on a day to day basis. Okay, so this was really just the tip of the iceberg, as you could tell, um, in terms of what it takes to become a consummate leader. Um, there's really far too much that goes into it than I could possibly share in this episode, keeping it at a, re at a reasonable length. Um, but if you think about it, if being an exceptional leader were that easy, every leader would be that way. Um, and so even though I think most people probably have it in them to lead really well, I actually think there aren't as many great leaders as you might expect, just because people aren't focused on it. But now that you're familiar with the characteristics of being a consummate leader, you can start to become one right now. So I just want to finish with a quick review to make sure that you remember what we covered. Um, so the seven characteristics that I discussed today in terms of being a consummate leader were self-awareness, spirituality, self-management, positivity, authenticity, relationship building, and coaching and developing. And the four suggestions I gave you to start to become a consummate leader are first, making a list of your strengths and developmental opportunities. Then secondly, asking for feedback. Third, writing a calling description. And then fourth, try out coaching with compassion. Um, and I think I'd like to close with a bit of a pep talk. Um, so I love this quote by Whoopi Goldberg. She said, we're here for a reason. I believe a bit of that reason is to throw little torches out to lead people through the dark. And I hope you realize that you have it in you to be an amazing leader who can better others' lives and transform workplaces and communities and even the world. You know, people's work lives trickle over into their personal lives. And I've seen firsthand how exceptional leaders can really have a far reaching impact. So go out there and help others to just truly achieve great things. Okay, that's it. And like I said, I know this was a really quick overview, but if you're curious about other ways to improve your leadership skills, then I encourage you to check out my book, The Consummate Leader. Um, you can get it on my website or on Amazon. And as always, I would love your feedback. So reach out to me on Twitter at Patricia underscore ATL or on my website at silverliningpsychology.com. Have an awesome day.